Please be seated. We have been talking about prayer the last couple of weeks here, mostly how not to pray. Not all prayers are created equal, you know. And Jesus said that some prayers are not prayers at all. And, and some prayers are not rewarded by God at all. Think about that. And specifically, Jesus said, don't pray like a hypocrite and don't pray like a pagan. And then Jesus says, instead, do two things. Pray in secret and pray like a child. Pray in secret and pray like a child. To, to pray in secret means you and I, we get one-on-one -on -one with God so that when we're in God's presence, there's no acting, there's no pretending, there's no performing, and that's... That's when prayer gets real, and that's where the reward is. And then pray, pray like a child would talk to their father. That's, that's an important image. Openly and spontaneously and honestly and respectfully. So this is the way the Lord's Prayer begins. Next slide. Pray then this way, Jesus says, Our Father who is in heaven. Our Father. That's the invitation to pray, pray. Jesus says is as normal as a child wanting to talk to their father. So we're not praying to planet Earth. We're not praying to saints. We're not praying to angels. We're not praying to ourselves. We're not praying to others. We're not praying to Mother God or any other God. Jesus teaches us to pray to God the Father. And this is where prayer begins, as child and father. Now, I'm not able to talk to my father. My father died 25 years ago. And then 10 years before that, he had a massive stroke. He was paralyzed. His whole left side of his body was paralyzed. It's a wonder he survived so Really, the last meaningful, lengthy conversation I had with my dad was 35 years ago. It just leaves a big hole in my, in my heart. So it was 1988. Cindy and I were in Pennsylvania. I was a youth pastor there. And my mom and dad drove out from Buffalo, Minnesota to spend time with us. That's when I was ordained or drained, as my friend said. I was ordained in the ministry. And, and before my mom and dad left and drove back to Minnesota, I can remember like it was yesterday, my dad stood there in the kitchen by the sink, and he prayed for Cindy and I. It was just awesome. It was the best memory I can remember of my dad, to be honest with you. It was really the last time we, we stood up and talked to each other. After that, it was a few visits to mom and dad at home. He was suffering. He was in the nursing home. So what a great, what a great time I had with my dad. But that was 35 years ago, and I have to say I miss, I miss being able to talk to my dad. But so prayer is meaningful to me because it helps fill that father-child void in my life. And some of you know what that's like. You, you just maybe need more prayer than others because you need to talk to your father in heaven. And what a beautiful thing when a dad prays for their kids and when the kids pray for their dads. It's just as sweet as it gets. Thomas Watson, the Puritan pastor, said, God is the best father. Because he's perfect, he's all wise, he's all loving, he's rich, he reforms his children, he never abandons us, and he never dies. So here's the question of all questions when it comes to prayer. Do you have assurance this morning that God is your Father in heaven? Do you have assurance that you are his child? And Jesus said, nobody comes to the Father but through me. God becomes our Father when we come through Christ, when we believe and receive Christ. 
That's how we secure that father-child relationship. If you're saying, well, I'm not sure if God is my Father in heaven, then it's, it's time to do this. Believe and receive Jesus as your Lord and Savior. Make that your first official prayer. God, be my heavenly Father. I need a heavenly Father. Come and be my heavenly Father. I want to be your child. John, John 1.12 promises this. All who receive him, all who believe in his name, he gave the right to be children of God. And that happens by faith. So if by faith you put your faith in Christ as your Savior, now you can have assurance you are a child of God. That opens up that relationship between you and your Heavenly Father. And now your prayers will be heard and your prayers will be answered. And God will meet with you in prayer. So do that first. Make sure you have that relationship with your Heavenly Father and that you know you are a child of God. So now we're going to look at the Lord's Prayer. We just said it together a few minutes ago. There are six petitions to the Lord's Prayer. Before we look at the petitions, let's look at the overall structure. There's six petitions divided in two parts. The first three are about God's glory, God's name, Matthew 6, 9, God's kingdom, verse 10, God's will, and then the last three are for our good, petitions for our good. We need daily bread, we need forgiveness, we need protection, protection meaning spiritual protection, don't lead us into temptation, deliver us from evil. Now many of the catechisms, like Luther's catechism, make seven petition because it takes this last one for protection and it makes it two instead of one. I think it's just as good to make it one petition for spiritual protection. So notice there's this perfect balance here in this prayer between God's concerns and ours. It's 50-50, right? Three for God's glory, three for our good. And that's instructive, I think. And it also gives us priorities in prayer we come with God's interests first, that's worship and praise really, and then our needs come second. And notice when we're praying for our needs, there's one need for the physical body, that's daily bread. We need bread, right? We have to live. But there's two needs for the soul. Our need for forgiveness, that's really important, to give and receive forgiveness and our need for spiritual protection because we're in this battle against the world, the flesh, and the devil. There's temptation. There's real evil that we face. So there's two prayers for the soul, one prayer for the body. I was teaching this years ago to my youth group. And so I played a song from 1956, Elvis Presley, Blue Suede Shoes. Anybody know Blue Suede Shoes? What a dumb song, but a fun song. <laughs> I mean, he says, you can burn my house, you can steal my car, you can make me drink liquor from an old fruit jar, and, but do anything you want to me. But honey, don't you step on my blue suede shoes. Don't you step on my blue suede shoes. Anybody wearing blue suede shoes today? And then he says, it's one, one for the money, two for the show, three to get ready, now go, cat, go. So, I hope I don't ruin the Lord's Prayer, but I'm going to say there's a one, two, three structure in this prayer. There is one for the body. There's two for the soul. There's three for God's glory. Now pray, cat, pray. I mean, this is the way you want to pray. I mean, it's there. I hope I didn't ruin the Lord's Prayer for you. <laughs> So if we pray according to this one, two, three pattern, maybe that all in itself will make our prayer lives more rewarding because consider devoting half of your prayer time to praise and worship and for the glory of God. Just enjoy being with the Lord. And then the other half for your needs. And then when you pray for others, pray twice as much 
for what their soul needs. We all need this forgive. We, this forgiveness thing is important to give and receive forgiveness, and then we need protection in our spiritual battle against temptation and evil. So I'm not saying we always have to pray in threes or six or one, two, three. Sometimes you just have time to pray one. That's okay. I'm saying that this is the model that Jesus is teaching us how to pray. He's the king of prayer, right? Is there anybody better at praying than Jesus? So he says, pray this way. There's nothing lacking in this prayer. There's everything here for us to pray about God's glory and for our good. So today I just want to look at the first three. I'm going to save the, the final three for next week. Hallowed be thy name. That's where it begins. This means that we pray with and we pray for a great reverence for God. The world is so irreverent right now. Is there anybody reverent about anything anymore? There's nothing is is reverent. Nothing is sacred. So this is like David's prayer in Psalm 86. There is no one like you among the gods, Lord, nor are there any works like yours. You alone are God. So the first petition is like the first commandment to have no other gods before me. That's the first commandment. The first petition is like that. There's no other God but you. God's name refers to his being, his reputation, his works. To hallow means that God would receive the honor that he deserves as God. That God's reputation would increase in the world. That there would be more worship of God in the world. So in short, we're praying, God, you are God. Not Buddha, not Allah, not Krishna, not nature, not any person or any idol. God is God. There is no other. That's how we begin this prayer. It's like Jesus praying in John 12. Father, glorify your name. It's like Paul taught us in 1 Corinthians 10. Whether you eat or drink or whatever you do, do all things for the glory of God. That includes prayer. When we pray, do it for the glory of God. Do that first. Kevin DeYoung wrote a book on the Lord's Prayer, and he said this, there's a reason that this is the first petition. It's the one that holds all the others together. It puts all the others in focus and in the right order. If your child came to you and said, Daddy, we have several requests for you, But before we give you any of our requests, we want you to know we love you, and whatever you say, we want you to be honored. That's a great way to start. If you're going to ask Daddy something, start with that. Daddy, I got something I want to ask you, but before I say that, I just want you to know you're the greatest dad in the whole world. And no matter what you say, I'm good. Now, can I ask you something? Yeah, Dad says, yeah, you go ahead. You ask for what you need. So it's a beautiful way to start our prayers. We say something like this, Father in heaven, I have several things to ask you, but before before I do, I want you to know you are my God. You're the greatest thing that's ever happened to me. And whatever you answer today, I want you to be honored. What a great way to start our prayers. So this petition is first because it honors God as God first in all of our praying is guided by that principle. So the second petition of the Lord's Prayer is this, your kingdom come. Now here's another weighty and mighty prayer. We pray for Christ to rule in the hearts of people and we're also praying for Satan's kingdom to be undone. The kingdom of God is both a rule and it's a reign. And and so this second petition, we're praying for Christ to rule in individual hearts and also for Christ to return and reign in this world. This is his world. Again, I want to quote Thomas Watson. He did this amazing work on the Lord's Prayer. He says, implied in your kingdom come 
is that we pray against the devil's kingdom, that his kingdom may be demolished in the world. Satan's kingdom stands in opposition to Christ's kingdom. The kingdom of Satan is a kingdom of impiety. Nothing but sin goes on in his kingdom. Murder and heresy and lust and treachery and oppression and division. And we could add more and more things like lying and envy and jealousy. Satan's kingdom is a kingdom of slavery. I saw a satellite photo of North and South Korea from space. Have you seen that? Have you seen that satellite photo? North and South Korea from space. South Korea is all lit up. You can almost see the outline of the whole country in lights. North Korea is completely in the dark. What is the difference? Well, God's kingdom has come to South Korea. There are There are little outposts of the kingdom called churches everywhere. There are believers everywhere. The gospel has come to South Korea, but not in North Korea. North Korea is in darkness, literally and spiritually. Thy kingdom come to North Korea. It's praying in Colossians 1.13 where... It says that Christ rescued us from the kingdom, the domain of darkness, and he transferred us into the kingdom of his beloved son. We're praying that people would would come into the light and step out of darkness when we pray, thy kingdom come. Your kingdom come is a prayer for liberty, for individuals, for nations, for this world to be set free by Christ and for Christ the king to return and rule this world again. What an awesome thing to pray. The third petition in the Lord's Prayer is your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Pray that God's will is done on earth. Pray that God's will is done on earth as it is in heaven. So the third petition has two parts. There's that matter of doing God's will, and then there's the manner of how we do God's will as it is in heaven. Well, how is God's will done in heaven? But first, what do we we mean by God's will? One of my favorite verses is Deuteronomy 29, 29. The secret things belong to the Lord our God, but the things revealed belong to us, and our sons forever, so that we may follow all the words of this law. So by God's will, we can mean his secret will or his revealed will. Roughly those two categories. By secret will, we we mean his sovereign will, his will of decree. This is not for us to know. This is for God alone to know. That's his business. But God's revealed will, his moral will, the Ten Commandments and so on, his will of desire, it's it's in the Bible. That's for us. That's for our families. That's for our kids. We teach it, we obey it, and we're praying here that we wouldn't just talk about it, but that we would do it. We would get it done in our lives. But then there's also the manner of how we do God's will. We do God's will as it's done in heaven. So think about this. How is God's will done in heaven? I mean, can you imagine any heavenly creature or angel dragging their feet or procrastinating in getting God's will done in heaven? Can you imagine that? I mean, you're never going to hear the angel Gabriel say to the Lord, I'm working on it. I mean, that just doesn't happen. I mean, when God speaks to the angels and sends them on, a, on an assignment, it gets done, right? <laughs> There's no delay. So we're praying that God's will would be done cheerfully and gladly and swiftly. What else is there to do in heaven other than the will of God? Right? For us, 
What else is there to do in this world but God's will? Right? (laughs) What else is there to do for us too but God's will? And to do it cheerfully and gladly and swiftly. This is an awesome prayer, don't you think? May God's will be done. May it be true in the world. So when we pray your will be done, we're praying that we will obey what we know, God. We all know what God wants us to do. We, but we procrastinate, we drag our feet, and, and we don't do it joyfully and gladly and fully as we should. So Cindy and I, we went to a movie Friday night. We went to the Jesus Revolution movie. You got to go see it. I loved it. I cried, but I cry. I cry all the time in movies. That's no big deal. Jesus Revolution movie. You have to go see it. It's a Christian film. It's well done. You go back to the 1970s. Oh, we love the 70s. There was a huge revival that swept the country. And it's based on a true story. Greg Lowry and other hippies, they were searching for love in all the wrong places. And it's also the story of Chuck Smith, Pastor Chuck Smith. It's played by Kelsey Grammer. He's the one who founded Calvary Chapels. Calvary Chapels, a very strong, very strong denomination of churches. So Pastor Chuck, he meets this hippie preacher. It's weird. It's awkward. And the hippies start coming to church. And, oh, it's just a fun story. But revival, revival broke out. The church was never the same. It was real. It was also very uncomfortable. Pastor Chuck invites the hippies in, and he rents this big tent. And the big tent is filled the first night. And he's playing all this great music, Chuck Gerard love song. I mean, that's all. We're all this great Christian rock and roll praise music began. You get to hear some of that. And then this strange thing happens as the revival goes on. This hippie preacher, he starts to get irritable. He seems to love the microphone and the limelights. And his preaching kind of starts to be more about him and his performance. So Pastor Chuck confronts him. I hope I'm not ruining the movie, but I'm not ruining the movie. He says to this hippie preacher who God is using, he says to him, this isn't about Jesus anymore. This is about your ego. And it's tough because these two friends separate. They separate. It's a sad movement, moment in the movie, but the Jesus movement goes on, but these friends had this clash of wills. So whenever we pray, your will be done, we are just guaranteed to be on some collision course with self-will, with ego, with pride, and that's why we need to pray this constantly in, in every family, in every relationship, in the church, that we would check our egos at the door and pride and the jealousies and everything and just be together. This is an our prayer. Your will be done in us. This is about us so that we would want his will more than anything to do it fully and joyfully as it's done in heaven. So these first three petitions of the Lord's Prayer are about God's glory, His name, His kingdom, His will. And Jesus taught us to start our praying with what God wants before we pray about what we need. Once in a while, I get a text from my kids And uh, I got a text last week from Kai Rose, my daughter, and she likes to send me texts of trucks for sale. She's shopping for me, looking around for these really nice trucks, nice and clean, no rust, low mileage trucks. So she sent me a picture of a Ford Ranger, a nice, really nice, clean Ford Ranger in Iowa. And she liked it, I liked it, I'm not going to buy it. But I like the fact that 
She knows I want a truck. One day I want a truck. That's on my list. And she knows what I want. And so when she thinks about me, she shops around, sends me a picture of a truck for sale. Isn't that cool? And I got to thinking about it. She's thinking about what I want. How crazy is that? What kid thinks about what the parents want and sends me pictures and everything? It's so sweet. So think about this. The Lord's Prayer begins like this. It begins with us thinking about what God wants. Is that beautiful? It's the best kind of praying. C.S. Lewis said this, prayer in the sense of petition, asking for things, is a small part of it. Confession and penitence are its threshold. Adoration, the sanctuary, the presence and vision and enjoyment of God, it's bread and wine. That's the first three petitions of the Lord's Prayer. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, help us to pray like this, the way you taught us. So I pray today that your name and your word has been honored through the sermon, through our listening that you have been respected and lifted up. You are the only true God. You're the only one who brings us the true word. We worship you alone, and we pray your kingdom would come. Come and rule our hearts this week. Help our hearts not to be so restless, but more content in you. And, And expand our obedience to you this week as individuals as husband and wife, as families, as, as children and parents, as a church body. Increase our obedience. And may we not cling to any affection that it's not holy in your eyes. Give us holy and greater affections for your work and for, for what you want to see happen in this world. And God, drive this darkness out. We see it every day how much this world needs the light of Christ. So help us, Lord, to share the good news of Jesus with someone this week and remind us every day of the good news of Jesus. Come, Lord Jesus, rule and reign in this world. This world is not going to be right until you come as our king. We are so lost without your leadership. And Jesus, until you come, help us to do your will, willingly and cheerfully and swiftly, even this day. In Jesus' name.